Welcome everyone to the Firing the Man podcast. On today's episode, Ken and I dive deep into what gets us fired up, fully torqued, totally inspired as we navigate this crazy life that is entrepreneurship. Ken, what's going on, man? David, what's up, man? Uh, uh, we're in the podcast studio today. I'm excited. Uh, the topic of the show, what you know, motivates us, inspires us. I mean, this is what we live for every day to get jacked and pumped and, and just accomplish our goals. So I'm really excited to share with the audience, with the listeners on, on the things that you and I, what, what gets us pumped and motivated and, and, and to share that with everyone. David, what's first on the list? Absolutely. So uh, let me reach behind me for those of you that are joining on video. And for those of you that are not joining on video, uh, I'm gonna describe to you what I have. This is a canvas painting of uh, Teddy Roosevelt riding a moose. He was out up in uh, Alaska. He saw a moose that was swimming and uh, he did what every reasonable man would do. He jumped on its back. And uh, I think this is the most epic picture of all time. Now, below you see uh, a speech that he gave. It's called The Man in the Arena. And uh, I'm going to read that speech to you right now. All right, here we go. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives vigilantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory of defeat. That is the man in the arena. And I'll tell you what, when I first read that, it made the hair on my neck stand up. Um, I absolutely love that speech so much so that uh, I got on, I think it was Vistaprint, and uh, found this awesome picture of Teddy Roosevelt riding a moose and uh, put that text in there. And uh, this is in the podcast studio when we're recording, but when we're done, it goes right back up to my office. and. You know, when I walk into my office, it just kind of sets the tone. You know, my goal is to be the man in the arena. So I don't know, Ken. What do you What do you think about that speech? Yeah, you know, um, you introduced that. I had never heard of that before, and then you were like, "Hey, check this out!" And so I went and read it, and it's real inspiring. Um, you know, it, it it speaks to you know like what you want to accomplish and um, being on the battlefield just getting in the game and so that's what that's kind of what it speaks to me and then you know the picture that you have like who like teddy roosevelt like you were both outdoorsmen and and, and we like wildlife hunting fishing and i can't think of anybody else who probably has had more impact in, in the country we live in than teddy roosevelt i mean he's a, he's um you know a lot of that can be attributed to him parks recreation you know we don't want to go into all that but He's very influential in that in that uh, space, and just that picture of him riding a moose like that's balls, right? Who the hell jumps on the back of a moose and rides it? And this is not a, a baby moose. This is a bull moose with massive rack. He's he's apparently in a lake, jumps on the back, and is riding this moose like that's classic right there. So yeah, it's a uh, very motivational. motivational. Yeah, he was an absolute legend, and you know his last night in office. Uh, I think it was something like three million acres uh, he put into public land uh, in perpetuity on his last night. And uh, just if you've been to a national park, you most likely have Teddy Roosevelt to thank for that. So anyway, that's the that's number one. That that's what gets me fired up is is the man of the arena speech. So uh, Ken, what's uh, what's number two? Absolutely. So. For any of any of our YouTube followers, anybody that watches uh, on their website on YouTube video, you've likely seen um, in my office. Uh, there's a poster that's hanging up. It's "Burn the Boats," and I want to read through here uh, the background on that, and then I'll give you a little bit of of what it means to me and how it's impacted me. Um, 
And so this is a phrase from Cortez quoted, if you want to take the island, then burn your boats. With absolute commitment, come in sight that create real victory. Cortez, uh, the concept of burning boats traces back to one of history's most inspiring leadership stories in 1519. Hernan Cortez led a large expedition consisting of 600 Spaniards, 16 or so horses and 11 boats to Mexico. The goal, capture a magnificent treasure said to be held there. Upon arrival, Cortez made history by destroying his ships. This sent a clear message to his men. There is no turning back. They either win or they perish. Although you might assume that Cortez, Cortez's men would have become despondent with no exit strategy in place to save their lives, they instead rallied behind their leader as never before. Within two years, he succeeded in his conquest of the Aztec Empire. Some date this concept even further back in history to the times of Julius Caesar and his conquest of England, or even the ancient Greeks. Regardless, the scenarios and impact were similar. So to me, burn the boats is, uh, you know, whenever I fired the man, I, I you know, um, mentally, I think a lot of times we give ourselves openings and weakness. And what this means to me, burn the boats is like, you know what, make, make a decision, commit to it, and don't look back, look forward. And so if you, if you burn your boats, there's no looking back, you don't have a boat to ride. And so whenever I, I, I quit my uh, engineering job, left it, there's no looking back, right? It's been almost a year and a half now, burn the boats, and the only way is forward. And, and I, I kind of translate that into anything that I have, goal, any goal that's really important to me, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to uh, achieve this goal and I'm going to make that decision and not look back. So David, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I, I really like this. And, and, you know, I think burn the boats is, is, you know, really a mindset. And, and so, uh, Ken is not advising that you give, if you do fire the man, don't, don't give everyone the middle finger on your way out. Um, don't burn that type of boat. But, you know, I, I do think having the attitude of, you know, I'm not going to worry if this doesn't work out. It's going to work out. I'm going to make it happen. And uh, I'll tell you what, 2021 has been filled with challenges and, and struggles uh, in our businesses. And uh, obviously there have been successes too, but this attitude is helpful. It's just, we're going to keep going forward. Uh, you know, if something takes six months to get from China to the U.S., we're just going to keep going forward um, and we're not going to let these struggles stop us. So um, yeah, burn the boats. I absolutely love that. Awesome. Uh, David, next one up. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, something that inspires or motivates me is to be around people that are masters of their craft. And I thought of a couple examples and this really has nothing to do with business. Um, the first one is Chug Wilson. Uh, this guy grew up on the outskirts of Iowa City and he had an apple orchard and he was beyond his time in terms of like breeding different varieties of apple trees. Um, he was all in on growing apples and he had a beautiful farm um, and you know he was really before his time in terms of like being organic and using uh, natural fertilizer and the guy just he loved apples and he loved apple trees and he loved eating apples and he just he was, he was awesome. And, and when you talk to him and he talk about like the different varieties uh, that he was developing, you could see that he was like totally jacked up and excited about what he was doing. And just being around that, it rubs off on you. You know, I aspire to be a master of some sort of craft at some point in my life. And, and so, um, you know, he, he's example num number one. Uh, example number two, I met a chainsaw carver in, in Festus, Missouri. And that's what he does for a living. And the guy's an absolute artist and he's all in. He gets totally excited about what he's doing. Um, he does. He told me, he's like, I don't really like doing boring designs, like just carving your last name into a log. Like I like doing really epic stuff. And it, it was just infectious talking to him. Like he was so excited about what he was doing. And I absolutely love that. So we, we talk a lot about on the podcast about surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals. And, you know, I think that's really helpful in business uh, to surround yourself with other business people. However, uh, just being around like a fellow master um, 
of whatever, I, I think that that is also helpful and inspiring and motivating. So Ken, what about you? Do you like when you think of people that are masters of their craft, what do you, what do you think about? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have a quick story to share. Uh, this was about probably five, seven years ago. I had a pair of boots that I bought, you know, and I, I'm pretty cheap. I don't usually spend more than $50 on a pair of shoes. And I bought this pair of boots and they were, it was nearly $200 for this boots. And so I wore them for about a year. And then, uh, one of the soles started coming off and I was like, I was like, damn. And so I was talking to, uh, you know, my dad and he's like, well, there's a, there's a shoe cobbler like in this one plaza by the house. I'm like, Oh really? What's that? And he's like, that's someone that makes shoes. And I'm like, okay. And in this day and age, you don't really think of people making shoes, actual shoes. So I'm like, that's worth a shot. You know, I don't want to just toss these boots. So I go over there, uh, go in, um, walk through the door and, and it looks like, uh, it looks like it's a, a blast from the past of like the 40s or 50s. Everything inside there was like really old. So I go in there and a guy greets me, comes up, uh, and I can't remember his name, but he was probably in his late 50s, early 60s. It was a, a Russian guy, uh, probably no more than five foot six. And I showed him my boots. He had very, uh, very little English and I had very little Russian to give him. So. He looks at him. I show the show him that it's broken, and he sh kind of shakes his head and, and he's like, "Yeah." And then he just writes me this old receipt and he hands it to me and says, "One week." I'm like, "Okay." So I go go back a week later and I go in there and he didn't hear me, and so he was just working away. He had all these different kinds of machines. He's like sculpting leather, doing all this stuff, and I'm like, "Holy crap!" comes over and uh there was a little girl that was in there and so she comes over and and uh i hand you know hand her the receipt and she looks around she gets the shoes and and i and i said you know how, how long has he been doing this and it's like uh, that was her uh grandfather and he had been he had been doing that since he was five his father taught him in russia and i'm like this is someone who has perfected a craft and so i looked at i picked up my boots and i looked at them and I couldn't tell one from the other. One of them had a half the sole ripped off, and and I and I looked inside there, and he had even put new like uh, inserts in the bottom. I'm like, like this is insane. Like someone to take that and just repair it. So um, when I think of someone that's a master of their craft, they practice it every single day for a really long time. I think uh, what does it take? Ten thousand hours, to, and you're considered an expert in something. And so, um, like you mentioned earlier, surround yourself with like-minded people to learn from and then just show up every day practice your craft sharpen the sword every day you know it, it it's it gets a little bit sharper every single day over a long period of time you know i think there's something about just being human and being attracted to this and and i'll give you an example uh two examples uh forged in fire uh which is a knife making tv show on the history channel have you seen it yeah um those guys have been making knives their whole lives and they're masters of their craft. And it's really cool. I think like that's probably why that show is so popular. And you can, you know, if you apply this thought to TV, boy, you know, cooking shows, like watching world-class chefs cook and prepare a dish, like there's something attractive to just watching that. And so anyway, I don't believe that I am a master of any craft yet, uh, but someday. I hope to be a master once I get my 10,000 hours in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David, number four. Yeah, so um, usually when I think of like getting motivated and, and jacked up, I, I think of like, you know, an elevated heart rate and, and you know, doing something physical. And, and this next one is actually the opposite of that. Um, it's a sensory deprivation tank, uh, also known as float tanks. And uh, I had my first experience with these about two years ago and boy have they been a game changer so for those of you that are not familiar with this um imagine a giant tank of water um probably four or five times the size of like a big tub like it, it's giant and in each tank there are there's about 1200 pounds of epsom salt there's so much salt in there that you're buoyant you just float and uh, that water is heated to 98.6 degrees and uh, it's totally dark. So that's the, the goal is to, to 
you know, float in that tank and be totally weightless and relax. And I go for, for 60 uh, minute appointments. And I'll tell you what, in terms of like clearing my mind or thinking of new ideas, this has been the number one thing that I have found. And, you know, one thing I would say is like, I've noticed a trend amongst entrepreneurs, like uh, sometimes don't sleep very well. I'm definitely in that category. I, I would say like borderline insomnia some days where I just have so much on my mind, I can't wind down and go to bed. And you, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about like uh, meditation and uh, you know, I've tried it. And, you know, I've, I've downloaded the apps and I'll do it for about 10 minutes and then I get bored. And I, and so I see the value there, but for those of you that have tried that and failed, try out a sensory deprivation tank. I mean, it, and I'm not joking, but I, when I get out of that, I feel like I've taken a nap for about three days. I mean, they're wonderful. So, um, Ken, you floated before, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I, I, I started, uh, floating uh, probably about four or five years ago and I, I don't do it very often, maybe once every three months or six months, but, um, you know, like you mentioned, David, entrepreneurs are stressed out. Sometimes you can't sleep. We have pressure. Um, and so a, a float tank to me, like it just like everything melts away. And so, you know, sometimes I've had different experiences with them where I go in and I just after an hour, like you said, you feel, I feel like I slept for three days. I came out of there and I was like, holy shit, like I feel good, real good. And then some other days I'll go in there and if i feel already relaxed and everything then i just kind of let my mind go and if i don't fall asleep then i like you said it, it inspires me to think of, of different stuff ideas things that problems that i have right going on right now thinking of solutions to those outside the box where i wouldn't normally think of it and it's just literally dedicated time to do that because you can't go anywhere <laughs> you're in you're in a, a tank right and you're floating and you're weightless and you can just like let all of your muscles and your whole body just go and then your mind is like literally free and so this is a if you haven't tried this yet go try it i highly recommend it um and it's uh it's definitely uh been a, a tremendous value in my life on on thinking of new ideas and just letting stress go away so yeah i, I really like it yeah, I would say like that industry needs a new PR team because sensory deprivation tank sounds like a torture chamber. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds miserable. And um, but this is truly one. Do not knock it before you try it. I mean, I, I think there's tremendous value in, in doing this. I would prefer to float than to get a massage. And so I've been floating about once a month. And I, I find that when I am most busy is when I, I go and float. And that's like the perfect time to unplug for an hour. And so um, if you, there's all over St. Louis, it, look it up. I'll guarantee there's one within 20 miles of most people listening to this show. Yeah. So um, Ken, what's what's number five? What, what's, what's the last thing that gets you just totally jacked up? Number five, um, when people, people that fire the man, like when I hear the those stories, you know, uh, David, you and I, we've, we've had our own experiences firing the man we've interviewed you know dozens of people on the show that have fired the man and it makes me um you know we have a we have a quote here uh i'll give this quote to david grabbing life by the balls and taking control of your most valuable asset time and that is so true and i don't think that we can uh it's really hard to explain that until you experience it i think and I've tried to talk to my friends and relatives that have jobs and until until that day comes where you're able to fire the man and you just that that weight comes off right off it it, it like to to this day like I can still see whenever I did that and and like it's just super motivational uh it it gets me it gets me going I like just want to go out and start sprinting like I'm so fired up just like sticking it to the to the corporations, right? Like you're like, F you, I'm working for myself now. I, you know, I don't need, you, you know, corporations or whatever. And it's just like freedom. What, what does it mean to you, David? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, this has meant different things as I've kind of navigated through working for the man versus not, um, you know, when we started this podcast, Firing the Man, uh, we both had full-time jobs. And I remember like, 
I'll, I can close my eyes and replay this, and I probably will for the rest of my life, is when you walked out of your job. And, like, if you would have, like, uh, read my mind or what was going on in my mind, it was like, fuck, yes, this is so sweet. Like, I, this is awesome. Like, Ken set a goal. He achieved it. This is it. He's he's at the finish line. He's also at the starting line of something awesome. And, uh, and that was, like, inspirational. You know, I, I aspired to do that. And now that I have fired the man and I'm on the other side of it, uh, I really like seeing other people do it because I know, you know, this is going to impact them monetarily, hopefully very positive. This is going to impact people's families, like the ability to uh, go to so every soccer practice, every soccer game, uh, spend time with your family, have flexible working hours. Um, that's huge. Like that's a gift that you know when someone fires the man that they're going to receive that gift. Um, you know, not having bosses and, and, and people looking over your shoulder and constantly fearing that, you know, you might be in trouble um, or you might not perform up to a certain standard, right? You, as a self-employed individual, you set that standard. And, and so uh, it's been night and day. And so, you know, as we, the other day, I was uh, texting Kiefer Hogue. Uh, he was a guest on our podcast. Yeah. Um, and he was telling me what he was doing in revenue. And I was like, dude, I'm so pumped for you. He's working construction right now. And I think he's halfway to like firing the man. And that gets me so jacked. Um, you know, the difference that that's going to make in his life. And, you know, he just like us, man, he set a goal, he's working towards it and grinding. And um, I don't know, it just totally gets me fired up. So anyway. Absolutely. Um, I can remember back um when you when you fired the man i was there that day when you when you left the cpa firm and you kind of walked out and i knew right then and there i'm like david is experiencing this and he's going to feel that you know and 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 like you said it's a gift your time right like that's our most valuable resource and and you know for all the listeners all the audience right now if you have a goal of firing the man um just take take steps uh one by one and you will get there uh we believe in you, um, you know, David and I, we were able to accomplish that. We're just two normal guys. Uh, well, normal's debatable, but we're just two guys. David's normal, I'm not. And, and, we, and we were able to do that. So you can too, if you're listening, set a goal, reach it. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're rooting for you. Absolutely. All right, well, that caps off our list of, uh, you know, five things that, that get Ken and I really excited and, and jacked up. So. Uh, if you're listening to this episode and you've got something that gets you fired up, uh, hit us up, firingtheman.com. Uh, on the right-hand side, hit the microphone and uh, leave us a voicemail. We'll see you next week.